Right. Let's let's take a short time just for prayer and uh, some prayer requests. Let's remember to pray for those that have needs. Anybody in here that would like for us to pray for you? Still want us to pray for you? Okay, uh, Ruby is still. Uh, she had another test, and things seem to be okay for now. And uh, we just pray God keep her well. That's the way it is. It has to be. And continue to pray for my wife. She she's doing fine. She's she's one of those girls that. She doesn't really complain a lot, but she works. She hurts a lot, she, and she, especially at night when she sleeps. And she went through and had a bone scan, and they're telling her that they had some abnormalities, but they don't know what they are, <laughs> you know. And so we're just taking it day by day. Anybody else need prayer in here tonight or this morning? Betty Hale. Betty Hale. Betty Hale had a stroke, <laughs> and uh, seems like she is gaining, regaining her uh, health day by day. She's making small moves. The thing about them is amazing is that she's had she's had at least one heart attack and this stroke and she's never been inside the hospital. They do it all at home. They take care of her. And uh, that's scary. It wouldn't be for me. I don't know how it would be. Uh, and also for Shimuel, we want to keep uh, praying for him. He's, uh, have, he's going to be getting out of the hospital again. The, the hospital is giving very positive uh, feelings uh, toward them. but. That they told them that they need to have him in a therapeutic uh, type of home. Rehab. rehab. A rehab place where they actually work with them. And there's only four in the United States that they knew of and they have, they have applied to get in. And of course they're going to have to have help financially uh, and that's part of it. If they get approved, then the finances are approved. But if they don't get approved, they're not. And if he doesn't get approved, then they'll have to take him back home, which they will. So we need to pray with them. They're very resolute. They're, they're very at peace with that, uh, saying, Lord, we want him in here. We'd ask you to open the door, but if not, we'll take him home and we'll deal with it. Uh, he's making some progress, so that's good. And then we'll pray for the conference. All right, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who has given us new life, has given us the Holy Spirit, has redeemed us through his precious blood, and made us brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, I thank you for each of these that have come here and come in Houston and come to all of the places where your people are taught and where they are uh, fellowshipping together. And I thank you for Brother Dan Gaiman's ministry where our young people can find a place where other young people are. I pray, Lord, for those names that have been given to us today. I thank of Ruby. I pray that you'll anoint her and uh, give her ease of pain and keep her but well. Heal those parts of her body that need to be healed. And my wife, I pray that you would continue to heal her and heal her eye and heal her shoulder and her, uh, her knee and, and the, the areas that give her pain. Lord, we just uh, beg you to do that. And we pray, Father, for Shimuel and for Betty. You know the needs there. You've already performed many miracles in their lives. But we would ask you to bring about healing and raise them up that they could continue on as a great testimony of your work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, today we're going to continue on with our study in the parables, but I want to, I'm going to take a little break here, because, not only because, uh, not because of me, but because the scriptures do it. Uh, we studied, we studied the parable of the, the, the sower and the, uh, the wheat and the tares and the mustard seed and uh, the leaven. And we, there's 13 parables in the book of Matthew, and they're all kingdom parables, and we've looked at them. Now, before Jesus taught those parables to his people, he, he started out with a parable. And his, his disciples and his apostles said, why are you teaching in parables? Why don't you tell us just what you want to tell us? And Jesus made an answer. He, said, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given, Matthew 13, 11. Without a parable spake he not unto them, and when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So here he is, going to teach in parables, and his disciples asked, why are you doing it this way? And he said, I want you to understand, and I don't want them to understand. And so when we look at the parables, there's something the apostles are supposed to understand that, that he did not want others to understand. And it had to do with the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to start today in Matthew 13, 51, if you want to go there, at 52 in your Bible, you can follow along. 
In Matthew 13 and verse 51, Jesus saith unto them, he's talking to his apostles now and his disciples, he's given them 13 parables, and he's talking to them, and he said unto them, Have ye understood all these things? And they say unto him, Yea, Lord, yes, we did. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Now here's why this is important and why I'm going to spend some time on it. It's because I know after I got out of Bible college and after I pastored in Baptist churches for years, I taught on the parables. And I went to every commentary that I could possibly find. I went to all of the books I could find. And not one of them ever talked about the kingdom of heaven in their explanation. They always talked about the Christian life, the church, and Christianity. Well, let me, let me remind you that when Jesus is giving these parables to his disciples and his apostles, he had not died yet. They had no knowledge of the cross. They had no knowledge of a resurrection. In fact, they didn't even believe him when he said, I will be raised up on the third day. So here they are. He's giving them parables, and they're saying, yeah, we understand this, but they had nothing of the New Testament. So my question is, what is it they understood that our preachers and our churches do not understand? And that answer to that is they understood that it was dealing with the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God through the people of Israel and not this Gentilized, generalized mixing of anybody and everybody who wants to say, yeah, we believe, and they get baptized and join some church somewhere. And so it's very important for us to understand that they only had the Old Testament. They did not have the New Testament. So when he talked about leaven, he, they had to take it in relation to the Old Testament. When he talked about the tares and the wheat, he, they had the Old Testament to look at. When he said the kingdom of God, they had the Old Testament to look at. They did not have a New Testament. They could not talk about a church. They could not talk about the cross. They could not talk about personal salvation. They could not talk about baptism. They couldn't talk about any of that because none of that applied. So that brings a very serious question is what does that do in our churches when our churches do not teach the people of God that when Jesus is talking about the parables that tell the future of the kingdom, they have nothing to say. Jesus said, every scribe which is instru instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which bringeth forth treasures of new and old. Our preachers do not bring forth new and old. They do not have treasures of old because they don't have the Old, old Testament and know the old law, and they do not know <coughs> about the kingdom of heaven. They have not been taught about it. And if you ask them what the kingdom of heaven, I've got, I don't know how many commentaries I've got in my, in my uh, uh, library and how many books I have and how many I have on my computer, but I've gone through all of them and only those that are written by people who understand the Israel message even have a clue what we're talking about in the parables. And they relate to the kingdom of God. Everybody else is so far off base, it is not even funny to read. So that's why when you go to the Baptist church or the Lutheran church or the Methodist church, or you go to the Pentecostal church or the Assembly of God church or whatever church it may be, they all have the same message they talk about the parables as it relates to the Christian life. But that's not what they were written for. Someone who is educated about the kingdom must have the following. The true exponent of the kingdom must begin with Abraham. You have to start with Abraham. And I have not heard... <laughs> I don't know, in all of my life, I probably have not heard from a pulpit. Now, I've been in some Bible studies, and I've been in some college classes where they talk about Abraham, but I have never heard a sermon talk about Abraham and his origin of the kingdom of God and his people and the, and the unconditional covenants that were made with him. Not only must they have understanding about Abraham, they must know 
that the Ten Commandments are the basis of the laws of the kingdom. And number three is, they must not forget to tell the story about the throne of David. How many of you have ever heard a Baptist preacher get up in the pulpit, or a Assembly of God, or a Pentecostal, or a Methodist, or a Lutheran, and say, did you know that the throne of David is still somewhere on this earth? Have you ever heard anybody say that? No, they don't say it's true. But it's true, yes, it is true. It is true. But they don't say it. I remember I was a, I was a missionary. Now, they called me a missionary, home missionary, for the Southern Baptists. I worked with their group, and I was in South Dakota. And I was planting new churches. And uh, we had a meeting. And I asked one of the preacher, we were in a car riding, and I said uh, to the people in, in the uh, car, I asked the question, I said, I was reading in my Bible where the God said that the throne of David would always be upon this earth. If that's the case, where is it? And they all go, ah, oh, that's just tradition. I said, no, this was in the Bible. <laughs> but they were all dumbfounded. They had no idea. And I, later on, I learned about the stone that is in England and, and, and uh, Scotland and how that the kings were coronated on that stone and where it came from. And I was in another car talking to a bunch of preachers and asked them about that. And the same answer, oh, it's just tradition. I said, well, you can go see the stone. Well, they think it's the stone. I said, no, I think they know it's the stone. <laughs> But they've got to know and understand these things. The throne of Jehovah established over the kingdom forever. He must show the meaning of the captivity of the kingdom nation. I, went, I, I spent many years as a pastor in churches, and nobody ever explained to me about that. I knew, I knew that the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom had a split, but nobody ever expounded to me what the prophetic purpose of that was or the outcome, or how it applied, or how it would assist us. Also, we did, we were, I was not taught the disciplinary experience and its greater redemption that would come to them. A wonderful restoration at the end of the term of punishment. If you're going to understand about the kingdom and bring old and new things out, he must teach the importance of the great volume of Israel prophecies. And part of the prophecies are in the New Testament in the parables that Jesus gave. All Jesus is saying when he's teaching the parables, when he says uh, the parable went out of the sower and sowed wheat, you know the story, and it, some of it was good ground, some was rocky ground, some was the way. So all he's saying is that, hey folks, after I'm gone and the kingdom of heaven is established, they're going to go out and sow the seed. And some are going to accept, and some are going to be good, and some are. He's professing and prophetically telling us, for the time ahead, this is what's going to happen. And then he says, not only that, there's going to be like the wheat and the tares. There, I'm going to plant my seed in the kingdom, and then there's going to be the evil one who's going to plant his seed. Some people think that all the seed was Israel in that case, but I don't. He had a different father. But he must teach the importance of the great volume of prophecies and tell of the removal of God's people from Palestine to another place. Boy, now that one was a shocker to me. When I learned when Nathan the prophet went into David and said, as he was king sitting in Jerusalem, and he had all 13 tribes. He had them all. He, had, he was at the height of his glory. He had all the people there. And he goes in and says, David, this is not where they're going to stay. <laughs> he says, God's going to take them and move them to a new place. And he's going to settle them where they will not be under the rule of the enemy. And they're not going to move anymore. That's why I keep telling people, why are you looking for us to all go back to, to Jerusalem? I corresponded about five years, six, not longer before I met you. But about seven years ago, there was a, an Assembly of God preacher up in uh, uh, Cuba, Missouri. And uh, he had read some article that I had written about uh, Israel was to be 
have new territory. And he wrote me a kind of a curt letter like, you know, who do you think you are? The Bible says they're all going to go back to Jerusalem. They're all going to go back to Palestine. They're all going to go back there. And I wrote him and I said, uh, well, sir, I'd like to know, based on the population the, uh, records that I have, that if you take all of Europe and you take all of Canada and Iceland and you take Greenland, the United States, New Zealand, Canada, and Australia and Southern Africa and all the countries where God's Israel people live, there's this many millions of people and they cannot fit in that land. And he wrote back and he says, getting them in there is God's business, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, boy, now that's really bright. <laughs> Get them in there, it's God's business, not mine. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's sad. But he's got to know why the Messiah came. I look, I've got, I keep some of my bad sermons just so I remember where I've been. You know? <laughs> I've got a sermon that I preached many, many years ago about why Jesus came. <clears throat> And uh, it, it's pathetic. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I've got right with it, I've got the new one. <laughs> why Jesus came, to redeem his people. And it, he, we've got to be able to tell why the Messiah came, why he had to come, what he did when he came. We must teach the importance of the great volume of truths about Israel and the acceptance of the Messiah, the great place in the world after the redemption. He must complete the story of the old before he can teach the meaning of the new. And then we'll be able to enforce the wonderful truths which came with the dawn of the new era. For instance, if you understand that Jesus came to redeem Israel and his lost sheep, then you can rejoice about Bethlehem. But otherwise, you know, uh, this probably was one of the first processes of thinking that I went through when I was first approached with this message. When uh, <clears throat> I, I, I apologize, I always forget the name of the fellow from Arizona who's Martha's dad. What's his name? Emery. What? Sheldon Emery. Emery. Uh, when he first contacted me when I was in prison and sent me some information. And uh, one of the things that I began to see and I ask is Israel rejoiced because they had no hope without a savior. They were outside of the covenant. They had been divorced. They couldn't, they couldn't have any relationship with God. And so when Paul went to them and said, hey, he's here, it's been paid for, you can, they rejoiced. The Bible says, and they accepted the gospel and rejoiced. Well, why would the dark, dark people of Africa rejoice? They weren't part of those people who were divorced. They weren't part of the covenant in the first place. Or the people of Asia, or of China, or wherever it might be. They were not part of that. So why would they rejoice? And yet, preachers all over the world try to make it out sound like that's something great. The beauty of Nazareth of Galilee, and the wonder of Calvary, and the glory of the cross, and the power of the resurrection and the victorious ascension. All of these can be great if you understand why he came. And the great promise of Christ's return to reign over the kingdom. In other words, the teacher of the kingdom is plainly told by our Lord that it takes the treasure of both the old covenant and the new covenant to tell the story of the kingdom. And that's the part our preachers miss. He answered and so to them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. That's what he told them in the beginning. It's for you to know. And that's why he taught them in parables. All right. I'm going to try to start on this next parable. And uh, we may run out of time. But go to Matthew 20 and verse 1 if you want. If you want to follow along. If you just want to take notes, you can do that. But in Matthew 20 and verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is likened to. I like that phrase. He always says the kingdom of heaven is likened to. A man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. 
And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And they say unto him, Because no man hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also to the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh day, at eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have brought but one hour, and hast thou made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the la this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? That's the part the Democrats don't like. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is it right, not right for me to be able to do with my own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last for many be called, but few are chosen. This is probably one of the more difficult parables, but it's not that, that difficult in my opinion. The question you have to ask yourself is, here's the story about a vineyard. First of all, what is the vineyard? Well, the Bible is very clear. In the Old Covenant, he says that Israel is my vineyard. Israel is my vineyard. So he went out in the early part of the day and got some people and paid them a penny. Went out a little bit later, got some more, paid them a penny. Paid them all a penny. So the penny... Here's, here's the problem when most people look at this uh, parable. They look at the penny as representing the amount of money you will earn or the glory you will earn or the power you will earn when you get to the kingdom based upon where you came into the kingdom. But that's not what the penny represents. The penny represents one little bitty thing. They all got in. That's it. They all got in. The people who got in last, they got in. The people who got in first, they got in. Why would these people think it was more valuable to have gotten in back 2,000 years ago than it is to <coughs> in at the end of the 2,000 years? Now, you say, well, you mean to tell me there's not going to be a reward? Well, that's not what this parable is about. There's another parable. Where Jesus said, and there was a man, and, and he, he had his investments, and he was going to leave, and he called his servants in, and he gave one of his servants ten talents. Now, you can call it whatever you want, that talent. You can call it talents of the, of the body, or you can call it money. You can say it's ten million dollars, whatever you want to do. And he called another one in and gave him five. And he called another one in and gave him one and said, well, I'm going to leave. I want you to take care of these and invest them, do what you can with them. And then when I come back, we'll see how he did. And the man came back and had ten, he made ten. The man that had five made five. And the Lord said, good and faithful. He said good and faithful to the man that made five, just like he did the man that made ten, because the Lord recognized that the man that made ten had more ability than the man who made five. The man that made five with his five did excellent for what he had to work with. The man that had one, he said, where is yours? And he said, I hid it. Well, why did you do that? Because I know you're a mean guy. And if I lost that one, you would really beat up on me. That's basically what the scripture says. And Jesus looked at him and said, well, if you thought that, why didn't you get it to the, the bar of the lenders and at least draw interest on it? Usury. The Lord said usury. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to his disciples, he said, the one who gets ten 
and the one that got five, in the kingdom, the man with ten is going to have ten cities to be over. The man with five will have five cities. But the man that has one, I'm going to take his one away and give it to the man that had ten. Now that's where the rewarding is. That's where the work is. But the penny that's here, simply, the Lord is simply saying to his apostles and his disciples, it's not important where you come into the kingdom and get redeemed. It's important that you get in. Amen. And he made it equal. <laughs> we'll go from here on the next time. We'll be studying some parables. There's other parables in the Bible. And the last uh, time at, uh, in Houston, we studied... Uh, two parables. And by the way, uh, since uh, Brother Dave and I have been, he's, he's teaching me a lot about audio visual and all that kind of stuff. I'm not real smart on that. But we figured out how to take a video and take out of it a CD. And so now, I get a lot of people that will send out a, BD, a DVD and they'll call me and say, well, Pastor, I, I, can't, I can't use those. I don't have a machine that will play them. And by the way, all of my videos are on YouTube anyway. If you want to see them, you just go to YouTube and watch them. But I get a lot of people who write me and say, you know, I really like your CDs because I can get in my car and I drive and I can listen to the CD or I can put it in at night when I go to bed and I can listen to it while I go to sleep. I said, well, I hope you're not using me to put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but this is helpful. And we're going to make all of the parables, not only are they in the book, but now they're going to be on CD. And you can get them. Does anybody have any questions? Any comments? Anybody want to add to what we've put out here today? Super. super well, that, that last super. one is a, a hard lesson to learn. Some people, you know, like you said, been in the trenches, working hard their whole life. Yeah. And, you know, the guy who comes in at the very last, it gets the same, you know. That is a hard lesson to learn. Yeah. Well, it, the thing is, you've got to remember it doesn't. It, what they're getting on that parable has nothing to do with volume. The guy that comes in last doesn't get any uh, any more than the guy first, and the guy first doesn't get any more than the last. They got in. That's it. The reward is going to be based on what they did. That's another parable altogether. But I know my wife. <laughs> she said, "Well, I used to work." in a place and said every once in a while they'd come in and do a study on salaries and they'd realize that they needed to raise everybody up and they raised them all up to my salary level and I didn't get a raise, didn't get a promotion or nothing. I didn't like it. <laughs> I understand how that would work. So, so I understand and, and I don't think the Lord is saying that he's unfair in that way. I think, I think brother, when we get to heaven, you're in the kingdom, you're going to have a hundred cities and I might have one. Uh, how many people know the definition of the word America? Well, I don't know. I, I do, but won't you tell us? It's God's d dominion. Okay. The dominion, I heard dominion of God, really. Right. I, I heard the word broken down from America. Reek. Reek is a German word for king. And Amer was a word used for God's, God's kingdom. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd like Dan, Dan uh, Gaiman's uh, humor, I guess, a little bit. When you walk, drive into his place, this is uh, the Church of Israel in the uh, Diocese of Manasseh, he said. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think that, I like that. Any other question or comment? All right. Well, hope we didn't bore you too much today, but you gave you something to think about. Really. And uh, we're going to be. We're going to go on with the parables. Well, there's several things that uh, that one of the lessons that I learned, and we'll deal with this more. You know, when I was a Baptist, uh, we were trained that there were sheep and goats, and that goats had to be converted into sheep. <laughs> but I found out that that's not easy. You're either born a sheep or you're born a goat, and you're going to go out of this world the same way you came in. Yeah, no goat goes out as a sheep. I got it right here. 
And the Lord never did say he was out looking for his lost goats. He was always out looking for his lost sheep. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, Brother Mason, how about you leading us in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings. Thank you for our pastor, his wife. Thank you for the continued prayers for those who need it. We pray for our children, born and Amen. unborn. We pray for this upcoming conference, that it goes great. People that are not need, wanted there, stay away. People that are wanted to come in. And we pray for uh, blessings, continued blessings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. Well, there's plenty of fresh refreshments back there.